Uh, use this one? Amazing. <laughs> Here, why don't you turn that off? Okay, this mic shows on, and am I audible? Okay, transmission on, recording on. Okay, good. We've had our first test of technical snafu this morning. Hopefully, that's it. Uh, good morning. My name is Steve Marr. I'm with Risk Management Professionals, and welcome to our Offshore Facility SEMS webinar series. Uh, this is part of our outreach program. Uh, as you all know, Risk Management Professionals does engineering consulting work uh, all hovering around PSM, RMP, and SIMS activities. And what we're going to be focusing on today are bow tie analyses and illustrate how that works together with other various techniques associated with the hazards analysis requirements of SIMS. Uh, even though we'll be focusing on offshore facilities and the SIMS regulatory requirements, uh, please keep in mind the fact that these uh, bow tie analyses are really a good problem solver for. Uh, uh, managing risks at facilities and interfacing that with various risk assessment activities. Uh, before we get into that, I'd like to introduce our key. I'd, actually, I'd like to talk about some logistics first. Uh, this is uh, using a WebEx platform for transmission. Uh, it is something that normally allows two way communications. We use that a lot for doing uh, remote HAZOP studies when people ask us to facilitate that, and it's convenient to get the team in this way. But we're using this today as a broadcast mechanism so we can provide this technical seminar. Uh, the majority of it will be uh, a PowerPoint image that you'll see on the left-hand side of your screen. In the right-hand side, right side of your screen in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see a video image of the speakers and uh, when we're doing the uh, non-computer demo portion of it. And uh, you can adjust the size of that window with, uh, with your mouse just by grabbing the edge and moving it to wherever you would like to. Uh, also on your screen, you'll see a chat window. Uh, the chat, because you're on mute, so that shuffling of papers, other meetings you have, or your cell phone doesn't disrupt the other participants that are that are listening in on the presentation, um, uh, you're on mute during this live webinar. And at the end of it, there'll be an opportunity for a question and answer. Uh, you can be unmuted, or you can use that chat interface to talk to our producer, Solvate Sather, at any time. Uh, she goes by the um, moniker RMP Corp on your screen. So just use that ID if you want to send a message to the uh, uh, producer, either to forward a question to the speaker during our QA process, or if you're having technical difficulties, or if you just need to have something interjected for the speaker, or you'd like to be taken off, off mute. Again, that's RMP Corp. Also, if you're having technical problems, the welcome scene screen that you saw earlier uh, had a phone number on it, 877-532-0806, or directly to the office here, 949-282-0123. Uh, either of those numbers, if you require technical assistance, somebody will answer the phone and either com either uh, commiserate with you or try to help you and, and get your problem solved. So let me go ahead and introduce the speakers. Again, my name is Steve Marr. I'm an engineer with Risk Management Professionals. Another engineer on the team, uh, Matthias Bradel, will also be one of the speakers uh, that will provide the general overview presentation and background information. About uh, 40 minutes into the presentation, we'll transfer control over to uh, Alex DeReiter and Don Bergwerf, who are with uh, CGE Risk Management Solutions. They'll be manning the computer demo that will provide an example of how a representative bow tie software package works and also illustrate a little bit more how to actually implement bow tie analysis. So I think that's pretty good in terms of where we're going. So let's let's look at what we're talking about. What I want to talk about primarily are we have a little bit of background on what is required for hazards analysis. The main theme of this presentation is to illustrate how to do bow tie analysis and how to integrate that with your with sensibly integrate that, not overdo it, but sensibly integrate it when you're dealing with regulatory requirements, uh, risks of high consequence events, and how to manage those. I want to illustrate how that works together with other hazards analysis techniques and how that fits into the overall regulatory framework. Uh, as part of that, specifically HAZOP studies, hazard operability studies, are used as a workhorse for flushing out or identifying hazards for a lot of high hazard facilities. 
Uh, I'd like to focus on that for a few minutes and use that as an example of how to integrate bow tie analysis into key aspects of facilities either onshore or offshore for process safety management, RMP, or um, the SEMS program so that you can sensibly manage risks and use those other unique characteristics of bow tie studies. Uh, Matthias will provide background, more background on the bow tie analysis and an example, and we'll be transferring control over to uh, CGE for additional uh, background and to also to illustrate one uh, computer software package that does a good job managing all these items. And I've also provided, and I'll share this with you, some references, and we'll open it up for question and answer. During the question and answer period, Sanem Sermeli, another engineer on our staff, will be joining us to handle the tough questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start with a brief history and regulatory background for these programs. Um, again, even though this is part of our SIMS webinar series, uh, onshore facilities certainly could use bow tie analyses for specific risk management challenges. What I'd like to bring out is the fact I'd like to show you how this fits into the overall framework. It's also important to remember how we got here. When you're dealing with high facilities that have the potential for high consequence events, uh, risk assessment is one part of the, the, the issue. Risk management and controlling risks is another issue. And it's really pushing the limits on technology, dealing with highly hazardous materials, and things that have happened in the past that have caused very undesirable events and tragedies that have really brought us here. And it's a continuous reminder of how important it is for all the uh, health, safety, and environmental professionals that are tuned into here, how important our job is to assess and manage risks. Um, there have been a number of incidents uh, over the past several decades that certainly draw our attention to key improvement areas in terms of how we manage risks at facilities. Uh, several of these have really been pivotal events in terms of awakening a need for regulatory reform or the application of various risk assessment and risk management techniques. Um, one of these and one of the ones that really brought uh, high hazardous facilities to attention was the tragedy at Bhopal, India in 1984, where there was a large release of methyl isocyanate and um, a number 4,000 lives lost, as well as uh, many tens of thousands of permanent injuries. So this is one event in 1984 that really awakened a lot of people to the potential for these uh, significant hazards. Um, that's actually when I started getting involved, too. Uh, shortly after that, one of the first things that happened was uh, industry's reaction to try to do something to assess risks. Uh, the AICHE formed the Center for Chemical Process Safety, and I actually had the honor of serving on the Technical Steering Committee from 85 to 87. And one of the first things that was done was put together some guidelines for the technical management of process safety. And really those same guidelines have been an undercurrent of all the things that come out with, uh, that have come out of other tragedies and also the various regulatory requirements associated with PSM, RMP, and SEMS. Um, so this event in 1984 really awakened uh, a lot of attention on, for onshore facilities for highly hazardous materials and started a, a chain, re well, chain reaction, maybe is a bad term, but started a lot of response to that that was very positive in terms of finding ways to effectively assess risks and manage risks at facilities. Um, in the offshore industry, uh, the Piper Alpha tragedy in 1988, where there were some uh, deficiencies in the work permitting system with respect to uh, various maintenance activities and the implementation of the work order process that resulted in 167 lives lost. Another pivotal event was in 2010, the Deepwater Horizon accident and, and follow-up Macondo well release uh, resulted in uh, 11 fatalities a number of injuries and a lot of oil released over 4 million barrels into the Gulf of Mexico that really drew national and international attention to the potential for hazard and environmental impact of our modern facilities. When you look at all these pivotal events and you also look at a lot of major accidents, it's obvious that they have a big impact on business interruption, lost confidence, contracts, increased regulation, um, when you look at them, they're relatively simple precursors and initiating events that really lead to failures to maintain the design intent and failures that result in a significant accident. Uh, one of the most effective mechanisms for improvement 
is, after looking into these, was really not by addressing a specific uh, immediate cause, but by really digging down to changing the way business was done, looking at safety, culture, and management systems. And it's that evolution of management systems that have led us to the industry guidelines that have come out of the CCPS and the API and other organizations like that, as well as uh, regulatory requirements in the United States, PSM, RMP, and SEMS, and in other parts uh, outside the United States, uh, safety cases. And we'll be talking about all those regulatory requirements. It's important to realize that these pivotal events have really pushed the evolution of the people's under engineers' understanding of how to design facilities uh, effectively, and also the regulatory environment, and uh, how regulators uh, man help facilities manage the safety and prevent accidents from occurring. Uh, as I mentioned, the uh, Bhopal accident, that's the top arrow, really precipitated industry's response by developing guidelines. CCPS came on board. API recommended practice 750 had a lot of the, the same management, safety management systems elements, and finally promulgated into process safety management by OSHA and their risk management programs by the EPA. So that pivotal event really draw a lot of attention into safety management systems, the management systems element, and it was really the failure of those, some of those management systems that were key contributors and root causes for the Bhopal tragedy. And that's, where we, that's how we get into bow ties. The, the bow tie analysis technique has the ability to not only help you analyze risks, but also help manage them. And both of those elements are very important towards controlling risks and the safety at, the, at highly hazardous facilities. Uh, the second ar uh, uh, arrow, when you're looking at U.S. regulatory involvement offshore, you're really looking at Deepwater Horizon and the Macondo well release last year as a pivotal event that actually led to the promulgation of safety and environmental management systems. Was that a unique concept? Well, if you really look at it, uh, industry did respond early on with safety and environmental management programs, or SEMP, API recommended practice 75, updates to that, and a lot of good initiatives. But there was no follow-up on that to make it to apply it uniform, and so the BOEMRE in 2010 felt it was important to promulgate safety and environmental management systems. Uh, outside the United States, the Piper Alpha incident obviously took front and center when looking at offshore safety. Uh, after the 1988 tragedy, uh, United Kingdom safety cases came about in 92, updated in 2005, and these things were um, have been a mainstay for not only evaluating risk, but also helping to manage it. We'll be talking more about that shortly. So let's talk about regulatory programs. When you look at the uh, different programs that I've mentioned out there, there are a number of different management system elements, uh, process safety information, operating procedures, mechanical integrity, management of change, and a host of others are all critical features of all of these programs. Um, and we'll be focusing on what it, for process safety management is process hazard analysis. Uh, also use the same name for the uh, EPA's risk management program. Here you're looking at all the different elements of EPA's risk management program. And also for offshore facilities in the United States, safety and environmental management systems. The key elements of that, safety and environmental information, hazards analysis, management of change, operating procedures, safe work practices, training, mechanical integrity, pre-startup reviews, emergency response and control, incident investigation, auditing, and also keeping good records are, are all critical elements of all these programs. In fact, if you look at the evolution of, of these different programs over time and realize you're talking about an evolution that started Certainly, um, uh, with that pivotal Bhopal, India tragedy, that was in 1984. That was 27 years ago. So realistically, there has been uh, evolution of these regulatory requirements, but a lot of these key elements have been a mainstay. And uh, highlighted in red are some of the very most important ones, hazards analysis being one of them. Hazards analysis, the regulatory requirement, the ability, the use of these various tools to assess risk, all those are a common platform for looking at risk assessment, and we're going to talk about how bow tie analysis interfaces with that to also provide you with a program for managing risk. 
this is a graphic that, sh that illustrates that overlap. Um, the area in green are all the elements that are in common to all these various programs. And I provided with you with a convenience table for specific regulatory references for all these different programs. And again, hazards analysis, the second item on the list, being a very key player for understanding potential hazards and assessing risk. Uh, let's talk for a moment about safety cases. Uh, this is uh, the safety case requirements and application were one of the key pre precursors to more extended use of the bow tie tool. So it's important to know those are out there, even though a lot of people who are tuning in, I know are dealing primarily with uh, US the re US regulatory framework. Uh, safety cases uh, came about, as you saw in the previous slide in 1992, uh, from the Piper Alpha tragedy. They were primarily focused on offshore installations. Although, like all these safety management systems, the elements are common, and there are also safety case requirements for onshore facilities. But the, fir the first applications were offshore, again, because of the historical nature of how they came about. The definition is a documented body of evidence that provides a convincing and valid argument that a system is adequately safe for a given application in a given environment. Now, the key words there is a documented body of evidence. A safety case is simply that. It's a case being made that you're, you have an adequate margin of safety at a facility such that it's safe to operate. Some of the original 1992 requirements were a fire risk analysis, looking at the ingress of smoke or gas into accommodations. Again, a lot of this is focused on a lot of things that didn't go very well uh, for the Piper Alpha tragedy. Looking at the ability of emergency systems to withstand severe accident conditions, uh, evacuation, escape, and rescue, again, key things that were problems during the Piper Alpha. During Piper Alpha. Uh, in 2005, they were updated for design notifications and providing a review of the safety cases every five years, but removing the resubmittal requirements. So basically, it was putting it back on industry to maintain and keep their program up to date. Um, the safety case contents typically involve the facility descriptions, excuse me, management systems for uh, HSE, a formal safety assessment, which includes a lot of things that you would do as part of a risk assessment, safety critical elements and performance standards, a demonstration that, ri that safety, that risks are as low as reasonably practical, and demonstrating that. And also <clears throat> some sort of statement about fitness to operate. These are all things that go into safety cases. When you look at the offshore safety management system regulations, it really is a full gamut from very simple applications such as SIMS and SEMP that focus on specific safety management system elements that have really been front and center for the uh, key elements since in the past 27 years since Bhopal of things that you really need to do to help manage safety at the facility. At the other end of the spectrum that includes safety management systems are safety cases that go beyond that also require some degree of risk assessment and quantification to help demonstrate that you've achieved an adequate margin of safety. Okay, so what I'd like to do next is really talk about now that we understand the regulatory requirements, the key, the key role that hazards analysis plays is talk a little bit more about what the hazards analysis is and helping you understand how bow tie can be beneficial here. Okay, the, for the hazards analysis, in all cases, all these various tools really are trying to give you a perspective on how likely a hazard scenario is and how important or, or the severity is of it. Looking at the severity, bless you, looking at the severity, looking at the frequency, those together give you an idea of importance. Just looking at frequency itself, you may, frequency itself, you may have a very low severity event that is a high frequency that may be fairly unimportant. You can also have, um, as illustrated by uh, dot number four, or scenario number four here, this very high consequence event, very low frequency, perhaps not even credible, also perhaps not important. So really gauging the importance and identifying if you have any uh, weaknesses in the system or any vulnerabilities is really a matter of looking at both frequency and severity, and that's what all these hazards analysis tools are trying to do is to put a perspective on things, help identify weaknesses, and identify if fixes are necessary. Uh, there's a variety of techniques out there. Some that are, are more simple can be used for straightforward designs or low-risk designs. 
you may want more complex tools for complex, more detailed tools for complex systems, things that involve safety instrumented systems or HIPS if you're dealing in some, some uh, design frameworks, high consequence scenarios, high risk scenarios, uh, high cost of corrective actions or common mode failures may require more advanced analytical techniques. So as the uh, HSE professional responsible for implementing risk assessment and risk management programs at your facilities, you really need to gauge what level of hazards analysis you need to apply, what tools make the most sense, and that's really what I want to go over with you right now, is, is helping to match the tool with the need. And again, all these tools are trying to identify hazards, looking at risks to life, health, environment, and property, identifying worst case consequences, helping you identify the safeguards in place, and providing some sort of objective method to, to identify if the safety margins are adequate or if additional features are necessary. Uh, here's a, a pretty handy summary of a lot of the tools that are commonly used. On the left-hand side of your screen, you see uh, simpler tools that require less effort, but there's also less that you get out of them. Uh, checklists, what if, uh, and what if checklist uh, hybrids, and also has it are techniques that are very useful early in the design phase for very simple systems to get a basic understanding of the qualitative nature of hazards and what might be identified. Uh, in the mid-range, you've got things like uh, failure modes and effects analysis, 14C reviews, and also hazard operability studies, or HAZOP. It's really the workhorse of a lot of applications because it does tend to delve into basic understandings and qualitative ranking of severity and likelihood. So it's very useful, you get the team involved, you get different expertise, and you are able to easily document uh, various scenarios that you can share with people later and really focus on when you're looking at potential design weaknesses. At the higher end of the spectrum that provides more power, you get the different insights, but it also requires in increased effort, are things like fault tree analysis, event tree analysis, layer of protection analysis, and also bow tie analysis. And it's the bow ties that we'll be focusing on today that are providing you with additional analytical horsepower and additional features to help you manage risks. Uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, what I want to do is contrast the uh, semi-quantitative or more qualitative tool that's very commonly applied, has up studies, bless you, and also uh, the bow tie analysis. Okay, so let's let's remember what our, let's take a look at what our objectives are. When you're designing a system, usually you have a schematic like this, probably a lot more complicated, that usually represent in terms of process flow diagrams and piping inst and instrumentation diagrams. And uh, what you're trying to do is that's the designer's tool. That's what people use to design it so that it functions and it does what you're, what you're intending the system to do. What all these hazards analysis techniques do is look at it from the other side. How can it break? what weaknesses might there be from a safety perspective, and then, of course, how to address them. So you want to take this representation of design information that you see on the screen, apply the HAZOP technique, and by the way, there's, we have a whole uh, webinar series on facilitating hazard and operability studies. You're welcome to look at our website and look at those various modules. What, we're, what we've done is taken our entire three-day HAZOP facilitation training course and distill it in, uh, in bite-sized chunks, if you may, for our, our webinar series. So you can get a lot more information about this if you want, but just remember that the HAZOP study goes from the design overview and a design representation. You apply uh, process deviations, combinations of guide words and process parameters to help you flush out causal events, uh, various consequences associated with the failure of devices that are those causal events, safeguards that are your barriers between the causal events and the consequences, and you do that very thoroughly for the entire process. So you use this systematic approach to come up with some sort of representation of what key scenarios there are out there and um, what you might do about them. In this particular example, you've taken a small diagram of a, uh, of a tank that's in a high pressure system on level control to a lower pressure system, and you've looked at failures that can occur and translated that design knowledge, that design representation into something that can help you flush out hazards, identify if there are potential weaknesses, and help the team focus on any improvements that might be necessary. So this is a workhorse that's applied in a lot of cases, 
So the real challenge as an HSE professional is how do you use those other analytical techniques to work with this, to do things um, we've had in, in previous modules, how do you use LOPA for uh, SIL assessment and SIL verification, how do you go through and um, uh, apply other tools in other circumstances. So what we're going to focus on today is how you take some of your key scenarios and apply bow tie analysis to learn more about them and find ways to help manage them. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Matthias Bradel, who will provide a little more background on bow tie analysis before we get into our uh, app, uh, more detailed application uh, using the computer models. Matthias? Absolutely. Sure. Good morning, I'm Matias, and I'll be talking about the Bowtie Basics. And uh, to start with the Bowtie Basics, I just want to give a little background on the Bowtie methodology. So the Bowtie method was originally called the Butterfly Diagram, and it evolved from the cause-consequence diagram of the 1970s. The technique itself was given a huge boost in the early 90s uh, when the Royal Dutch Shell Group developed the technique as a result of the Piper Alpha tragedy. The primary motivation was to seek assurance that the fit-for-purpose risk controls were consistently in place throughout all operations worldwide. The Bowtie method provides a readily understandable visualization of the relationship of such events uh, to a range of possible outcomes, the controls of preventing the event from occurring, and the preparedness measures in place to limit the consequences. Uh, now, this paragraph is a little wordy, but I'll elaborate on that further as I go throughout the presentation. But ultimately, the aim of the Bowtie method is to control the health and safety uh, excuse me, to control health, safety, and environmental hazards. <clears throat> now, what is a bow tie? Uh, what I have here is a heavily oversimplified uh, bow tie diagram, uh, but it does illustrate uh, the key concepts I have below very uh, well. So what we have in the middle is a top event, and this top event could be identified via some sort of hazard identification exercise, or it could either be uh, some sort of uh, concern that someone has in a certain process that comes up quite often and you want to address that concern so it doesn't uh, get out of control. Now, to the far left of the top event, you have the threat. Um, you want to identify your threat as something that's a legitimate cause of, of uh, creating this top event. Now, between the threat and the top event, you can see that we have preventive controls. These preventive controls are things such as a PRV that can prevent an overpressure situation that allows this top event to occur. Uh, now that from the top event in the center to the far right of this uh, bow tie diagram, we can see the consequences or impacts. Now, if this top event, uh, if the threat were to go through and allow this top event to occur, uh, it would result in some sort of consequence. That's why we have reactive controls. And you can see how they're uh, displaced as well. The preventive controls are in between the threat and the top event, and the reactive controls are in between the top event and the consequence. That's why this uh, outlines it very neatly and very easy to understand. Uh, where they fit in place. So the preventive controls act as a barrier from the threat to cause the top event. And then the reactive controls, uh, again, is sort of a reactive barrier, if you will, that once the top event has occurred, it'll mitigate uh, those top events to further develop into the ultimate consequences that we have on the far right-hand side. Uh, the objectives of a bow tie. So the objectives of a bow tie are to build on hazard identification techniques. Uh, they provide additional risk assessment details such as uh, equipment, uh, human error, environmental factors, et cetera. Uh, they provide risk management. Uh, Timmy Bota also provides risk management by providing visual framework for highlighting risk control elements, and it's also very good at providing risk communication. Uh, and, and it does that by providing visual uh, visualization of critical risk control elements uh, and additional links to specific des uh, design and operational characteristics. Now, the general approach to a bow tie analysis. The initial approach you want to take is we want to prepare draft bow ties. Uh, and to prepare a draft bow tie, uh, typically we have enough information, uh, which we get from uh, site physics or hazard identification exercises, to create this initial draft bow tie. Then from this draft bow tie, we want to review it with key personnel. Now, it's essential that we review this with key personnel, which include uh, operations personnel, maintenance personnel, safety personnel. And we want to review it with them because this will allow a true picture of what is in place and what will be presented. Uh, once we have that, we move on to our final bow tie diagrams. Uh, we want to keep these handy as they will be used throughout uh, when you fully develop an entire bow tie and use the bow tie methodology. Uh, following that, we want to prepare draft critical tasks 
supporting each risk control. Now, to prepare a draft, uh, you want to prepare a draft list of the tasks and activities to maintain the risk controls identified on the bow ties. And from there, we want to take those critical tasks that we drafted and we want to review those with key personnel. Uh, so once again, this is another essential uh, task uh, or approach, excuse me, that we want to uh, go ahead and do. And we want to review this task again with people who carry out, uh, carry these out to ensure that they're accurate and that they're implemented as well. Uh, so here what I've done is, for the bow tie analysis approach, I've kind of pieced out uh, with a nice visual representation. As you can see, I also brought back in the top right hand corner the simplified bow tie diagram. And here I'm going to kind of show how we would like to assemble, ideally, uh, a full bow tie. And we want to uh, start by identifying the hazard. Now, a hazard can be, uh, in many cases, the substance or chemical that you're working uh, around or the substance in the oil industry, for instance, on a platform that you're trying to harvest. Uh, such as uh, oil. So this is a this is definitely a hazard. It's a dangerous chemical, and you're working around it all the time. So this this is something we want to identify readily, and then you know make sure that uh, we're controlling it and we're managing it. Because as long as this hazard is controlled and managed, it's really of no harm. Uh, moving forward, we want to identify the top event, and as I described before, this top event can be identified via the uh, hazard identification exercise, or as I stated before, it could be a common uh, process, uh, common uh, excuse me hazard. Uh, identified for the process that you're working in. Now, for example, a top event could be uh, if you're in the offshore uh, platform industry and you're, you're, you know, like I said, harvesting uh, oil. Uh, if you're if you're transporting that oil through a pipeline, loss of containment is definitely a top event that could potentially uh, relieve, you know, lead to some consequence down the road. So that's the second thing you want to identify. The third thing you want to identify in building your bow tie is you want to identify the potential threats. And in the oversimplified diagram that I brought back, you can see to the far left, we have the threats. And the threat itself uh, should have the ability to cause a top event. An example for uh, a threat is a potential overpressurization. Or if you have, for instance, uh, the pipeline that you're running, if you want to uh, trans, uh, transport some oil, uh, corrosion, for instance, of the pipeline, which could lead to that uh, top event to occur. So that's something we want to identify. We want to make sure that it's actual, actually, uh, you know, that can, it can cause this top event to occur. Um, following forward, step number four, we want to identify the consequences. Um, again, if you look at the oversimplified technique, you can see to the far right, we have our consequences. Uh, the top event can lead to an undesired consequence. Um, and the combination of the top event and the failure of reaction controls can lead to different consequences. So if these reactive controls kick in after the top event has occurred, uh, depending on the, uh, the, the reactive controls we have in place uh, for that, they can change the outcome of the consequence uh, and thereby mitigating it. And an example consequence that I've listed on the far right is uh, fire, for instance. That's one example. Moving forward. Uh, number five, to identify the controls. Uh, we want to identify the uh, proactive controls and the reactive controls in the system. Again, going back to the diagram that I brought up, between the threats and the top event, we have controls. Those are our proactive controls. And the proactive controls uh, prevent the top event, excuse me, prevent the top event from occurring uh, things such as pressure relief valves, um, you know, regular corrosion inspection on piping, uh, that's a preventive control, which can prevent that threat from developing to a top, uh, top event. Uh, then we have reactive controls, which are to the right of the top event in between the top event and the consequence. These reactive controls prevent the top event from resulting in a consequence. Uh, detection system, for instance. If leak detection, uh, if you're working in refrigeration, you're working around ammonia, ammonia detection systems and alarms, things that once the top event has occurred, uh, this reactive control will kick in to not allow the ultimate consequence uh, from occurring. Uh, then the final step we want to take is we want to identify the escalating factors. Escalating factor, um, because controls that we put into place, proactive or reactive, uh, as, as humans and we tend to make mistakes, we can't really count on any control measure to be 100% effective. So an escalating factor is something that can relate to human error, for instance, uh, a set point on a, a relief device, for instance, uh, an incorrect set point. Can be uh, cause uh, can be an escalating factor. It can prevent that uh, mode of control from failing. It can cause it to fail. So these are things we want to further identify, and is also uh, a great tool to have because it's something that can tend to get overlooked. Uh, control measures are taken as you know a lot of times as 100% guaranteed, uh, so they shouldn't be. And escalating factors helps kind of define what things could go wrong with controls, and it could adjust your uh, your how your top event would release 
or how the consequence, uh, how bad it could potentially be. Now, what I have here is a key uh, excuse me, for key bow tie analysis elements, I've taken uh, the structure that I just presented to everyone uh, and the order of, in which it should be constructed and just given a little diagram. I apologize if it's a little hazy, um, but it should be legible if you can zoom into it. Uh, it's definitely legible. So as I've identified here, the, the hazard at the top um, is the hydrocarbons in this example that I have. And then the top event is uh, loss of containment. Now, what can lead this to this potential loss of containment I've identified on the far left is the threat. So the threat is the overpressurization. Overpressurization can lead to the top event, which is release of hydrocarbons. And then to the far right, I've defined uh, what the ultimate worst case consequence could be if that top event were to occur. Uh, in this case, it would be a fire. And in between, as I mentioned before, in the simple uh, bow tie diagram I had, you can see the modes of control, the proactive controls in between the overpressure and the uh, top event, and then the reactive controls between the top event and the consequence. And then on the bottom, bottom left, the yellow, you can see that specifically tags that proactive control, um, excuse me, the preventive control uh, from, it, it lists the uh, escalating factor of what could potentially cause that, that control to fail and allow that top event to occur. Now I only listed one, but uh, these can be uh, identified to each single one. So you can have a escalating factor for every mode of control that we have in place. And uh, that pretty much sums up, in essence, my portion of uh, Bowtie Basics. And so I'm gonna hand it over. Oh, I'm sorry, I did have one last uh, slide, sorry, Steve. <laughs> uh, I wanted to sum everything up in the end, and that's uh, just the unique characteristics of uh, the Bowtie uh, bow Technique. And uh, what bow tie technique, uh, I think it's, it's good and it provides a, a logical structure and approach, a detailed analysis with link to risk management. Uh, it also provides an enhanced ability to demonstrate the level of safety and the mechanisms required for risk control. Uh, it's great for communicating uh, risks. When you identify these risks, bow tie is very good because it prevent, uh, provides uh, diagrams, you know, colors, uh, red is in, in essence consequence is pretty obvious. Red, you normally think bad things. Uh, for instance, a stop sign, I don't like stopping, you know, red, <laughs> fire, red. Um, then we have bold lettering, et cetera. So it's very visually stimulating. It's very good for personnel who are not process oriented, uh, who are not uh, pros at, at the process that you're dealing with. So you can easily use this uh, to communicate the risks. Uh, moving forward, bow tie is also very good at evaluation potential uh, organizational vulnerabilities, uh, incident investigation support. It provides avail evaluation of the pr procedures. It also provides an improved ability to identify effective, uh, excuse me, effective system improvements. Um, it also provides improved workforce involvement so that we can get, you know, like I mentioned, since it's not specific to just process oriented people or, or maintenance or manage, uh, excuse me, maintenance or safety personnel or someone that's heavily knowledgeable on, on the process, it can broaden it and it can include your entire workforce who can have an indirect relationship on the safety of the system. Uh, so you can make, you know, easily communicate uh, via the visuals uh, that Bowtie allows so that everybody can understand it. Uh, also, it provides enhanced communication of critical safety features to management. Again, that goes back to the ease, uh, the ease of and the understanding of, of how Bowtie just lays it out for you nice and easy, and you can communicate that further to management who sometimes don't have the process uh, knowledge that, that as, as engineers do or the operators do. And uh, last but not least, uh, Bowtie provides direct reflection of out-of-service equipment and impacted safety margins. Moving forward, I want to hand it over to, I believe it is Steve. Steve, you take over. Here you go. Uh, do you want me to use my working with you? Yeah. All right, good. You can hold on to that then. Okay, what I'd like to do is, um, uh, as you all know, there's a number of bow tie analysis packages out there. Uh, what I'd like to do before we move on in terms of showing how that integrates a little bit more with other hazards analysis elements is I'd like to transfer control over to um, uh, to the CGE Risk Management Solutions, Don Bergworth and also Alex Derweiter, and uh, and allow them to demonstrate, uh, provide a little more details on how Bowtie XP can be used to effectively approach the Bowtie analysis and also help manage risks. So we can go and transfer now if you'd like.
Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alex Rajan from uh, CG. Um, and I'll be uh, taking you through uh, a couple of the uh, highlights of uh, Bota XP and how that works. Um, now, before I actually go to the, the software program itself, uh, I'd like to uh, show you a little bit on uh, what we're starting uh, is an integration with uh, Hazit. So what I actually want to start with is not Bota XP, but a uh, Hazit. And in this case, this is a little hobby project of mine um, uh, where I, I built this sheet, uh, which is uh, where you identify all of your haz hazards in a uh, normal hazard. It's a really simple hazard uh, process, basically, in this case. And you uh, risk assess it on people, assets, environment, reputation. Now, depending on what, how you assess each, uh, each hazard, something is either uh, a, a high potential hazard or not a high potential hazard. Now, what both eye focuses on are your high potential hazards. You don't want to do both eye on every everything in your uh, hazard list. Um, so you want to pick out the high potential ones and then uh, take them and create both eyes out of it. Um, so what I've done is actually uh, built a, there's a little ma macro in this, uh, which will take your hazard and make it suitable for uh, import into both XPs. So in this case, I, I've done my hazard with, with my group. And what I can do is actually take my, um, this is both XP by the way, I can take that File my hazard file and drag and drop it into both the XP, uh, and it will start. It will. I will have a little library uh, with the results of my hazard, and this will be the starting point for my uh, for the creation of both eyes. Um, so I, in this presentation, I won't actually explain a lot of the details on how how both the XP works. I'll just show you the results. Um, so basically, let's say we have this. Uh, hazard zero one, which is hydrocarbons, and we want to create a, a Bota out of that. We can drag and drop this into the, into Bota XP. And create a Bota like this. And this is, this was all the information that was in the hazard uh, concerning the loss of containment, uh, or sort of hydro hydrocarbons hazard. And this is now in both the XP ready to be taken to a workshop. So um, what you do after this, once you have your, defined your high potential hazards from your hazard and imported them into both the XP, is that you go to a workshop and work out what are the what can cause a loss of containment and what are my controls for everything. Um, so you'll work it out further. Now, uh, just to skip ahead, uh, let's say I'm just skipping to another boat time. Um, let's say we've done the, those actu that actual workshop and we actually have our bow tie finished. Um, this is what it could look like. In this case, it's a um, well-controlled bow tie. So my hazard is hydrocarbons information during the drilling operation. And then the top event is that the high influx of hydrocarbons to the surface. Um, now, one of the threats could be a well kick. So um, in both the XP, where you you can simply build out these uh, these threats. Um, let's say you have another one. You can uh, really easily um, add another threat um, and build out your bow tie diagram. Uh, now, for the well kick, there are three uh, controls in this particular bow tie. I I'm not saying, by the way, that this is a uh, complete bow tie. This is just an example. So. Um, if you're pulling your hair out on the other end of the line, um, this is just an example. Um, so, well kick, and there are three controls. You maintain hydrostatic uh, head, uh, you have your blowout preventer, and you have your pump plug. Um, now, you see for each of these elements, you can see the controls are actually color-coded. So, this, the color coding in this case is the, how effective they are or how effective they've been judged in the uh, BOTA workshop. So these two controls are very good. And then the third one is a, a poor control. Um, a couple of other things that you can also attach to your controls is who's accountable or responsible. Um, 
So I have, you can assign different responsibilities to each, um, to each control. Um, a third element that you can also attach to your control uh, to further deepen your, your understanding is the control type. So this is the, uh, the, the box that you see under here. Uh, Shell now uses uh, people process plants a lot. Uh, so that's what I've uh, mimicked in this case. So uh, this is a process, this is a plant, and this is also a plant control type. Now, of course, what you can do with these three elements, so the effectiveness, who's accountable, and the control type, is use it in your analysis. So you can say, for instance, if I have three controls, uh, that's pretty good. But then if I, if I also take into account the effectiveness of those controls, and they're all very poor, uh, that gives me a different picture. It gives me a different uh, sort of, different, yeah, different picture. So I might decide to, that I actually need a fourth control. Uh, based on the accountabilities, you can say, okay, if I have the same person responsible for every control on, the, on a threat line, that's not a good thing. So I need, um, I need a second person responsible or for another person responsible for one of the three controls. Uh, same thing goes for control type. If I have uh, the same, for instance, only plant controls on a threat line, uh, that makes it more vulnerable to common mode failures, so simply because if I have, for instance, if my maintenance uh, system is uh, insufficient, um, that can make all three of my plant controls fail simultaneously. So if I include, for instance, a people control, uh, I'll be more the, the the system will be more robust. Um, okay, so those are three elements: effectiveness, accountable, and control type for each control. Uh, you see one extra thing underneath these controls in this little box, which is uh, activities. In this case, uh, risk critical activity uh, 01 and 02. I'll show you the long format. Uh, basically, in this case, I just added, quickly added two one. One is maintenance, one is testing. Uh, now, this is actually, you use these activities to map your safety management system onto a bow tie. So you already have a safety management system, hopefully, and um, you can take that safety management system and map all of the activities onto the specific controls in the bow tie. Now, what people use that for is uh, two ways. One, if, um, if they don't have a safety management system yet, they can actually build the bow ties first, and then on top of the bow tie, they build their management system. Uh, the other possibility, if you already have a safety management system, um, people use this to, people map their safety management system onto a bow tie and then analyze where the gaps are in their management system uh, based on their analysis of the risks. Also, they can see where, uh, which activities are left after mapping it. And then if, there, if, if nobody knows why the activity is in the safety management system, um, you might actually consider uh, dropping it from the management system. So also to prune your, your safety management system, the bow ties can actually be really beneficial. Um, okay, I just want to show you a couple of the uh, escalation factors. In this case, the BOP actually has a lot, uh, just because it's a relatively uh, complex uh, piece. Uh, so let's say BOP integrity failure. Um, that's one thing that will make this that will make your uh, well, BOP itself uh, not effective. Blow, basically, blow, blows a hole in your control. Um, so once you have identified those escalation factors, you act, you also go to how do I prevent uh, this escalation factor from impacting my uh, primary control. So you do pressure testing, function testing, et cetera, um, or visual uh, checks with your ROV. Um, so this is actually, in a lot of, in a lot of uh, analysis methods, you actually stop at your primary controls. But in both eye, you uh, take it one step further and also think about your indirect controls. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so that's, for it. that's it for controls on the left-hand side. Uh, I'll just show you quickly on the right-hand side. So let's say you have an influx to the surface. To the right-hand side, you can have your uh, sort of hydrocarbon liquids discharge into the ocean. 
um, and then you've got a couple of the couple of controls. Uh, in this case, they're they're uh, judged good, but I'm not sure how good they are actually. Um, so you have controls on the left hand side which keep you in control, which prevents uh, anything bad from happening. But once you're out of control or you've lost control, these controls actually get you back to a normal situation. Um, now, if you look at these uh, consequences, you see these little uh, boxes underneath. Um, those are actually the risk assessments. So you you want to risk assess all of your different consequences. And in the software, you do that by uh, using a risk matrix. Um, so this is one for people. And uh, if you have a liquid discharge into the ocean, in this case, it's been judged as no impact or no injury. Uh, so you have your frequency and severity or um, uh, in this matrix, and you can simply click on something and judge and uh, assess all of the consequences. Um, so this is also gives you a sort of short summary of your risk assessments right on the right on the both XP diagram. Um, now, once you once you've done this and you've gone through your whole bow tie, um, you can say, okay, I've, I, we've now finished this this particular bow tie. Um, what can we do with it? Um, well, one thing you should always do, of course, is check the quality of your work. Um, in this case, we've built in in the, in the software a, 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 a functionality to actually check the quality of your work. So, for instance, uh, which controls have you, have, do you have where accountable has not been set? So you actually you, you identified the control, but you've not set a um, accountable party. So you can uh, double click on something in this, um, and it will try to take you through to to that particular control. In this case, they're in uh, escalation factor controls. Um, so you can also say, for instance, which controls don't have activities. So I need to have, I need to define activities for a control, otherwise it's not complete. So you can actually do a lot of the quality controls uh, with these uh, quality checks. Now, once you have a good, um, a good size um, both a diagram, uh, you can actually start reporting on these both diagrams. So I'll just show you one type of report. There's actually a long list um, with re possible reports. And you can actually, once you've put in the information into both XP, you can get it out in all kinds of different ways. So you can uh, look at the information from multiple perspectives. In this case, I'll just show you a, a traditional hazard register just because it's a simple, um, simple uh, report. So this is the same information that's in the bow tie only in a Excel um, file. So for people who like their um, their tables, they can actually review all the information in an Excel uh, sheet. So let's say this is the well kick threat, and then you have a couple of controls here, and you can see the control type, the effectiveness, who is accountable, uh, but also later on, here you also see the activities that are needed to maintain, in this case, the BOP. Um, if you scroll down further, you also get the risk assessments and everything. So uh, this report basically gives you the both a diagram only in an Excel sheet. And there are a lot of a lot of different reports that you can run. For instance, uh, you can generate lists of activities per job title, so that everybody has his own list of uh, sort of his personal safety management system. Uh, so we really focused on. Uh, allowing the information to be exported in a lot of different ways. Um, okay, so we also uh, mentioned in the presentation before uh, that you could also quantify your, your bow ties. Uh, so bow tie XP itself is actually purely qualitative. So there's, in this, whole process, there's nothing quantitative about it. 
uh, unless of course you count a risk matrix as quantitative, but uh, that's not the, the best thing to do, I think. Um, so what we actually um, created for people who wanted to do quantification is, a, is an add-on to Bota XP called a Bota Excel. Um, and Bota Excel, what that allows you to do is actually quantify your, um, your bow dies. Um, now, the way we set it up is that you actually you build your own model, your own quantification model, and put that onto a bow tie. So in this case, I've got a um, model that has three different values for each control, uh, effectiveness, some other uh, number which is focused, but I won't explain it, and um, a dependency number. Now, the, the dependency number is actually quite interesting. Basically what it does is it says, if I have four fitness for work controls, uh, sort of controls of the same control type, um, those are not independent controls. They're actually all part of the same larger system. So if I have four fitness for work controls, they all get one fourth. If I have three procedural controls like here, they all get one third. Um, and this allows you to get a sense of sort of the dependencies between controls. Um, so these all get one fourth, and then what you do is you um, multiply these numbers to get to a control score, and you sum the scores to get to a score for your whole threat line. So, for instance, this uh, human error threat is is a score of 1.625. This is the score of all of the controls combined. Now, since it's a scoring method, and in, th in this case, and not a um, die-hard quantification method. Um, the only thing that you can do with this is that say we want to be at, uh, or we, we can say 1.6 is higher than 1.2, so we need to focus on improving this threat because it has a lower score. Uh, the other thing you can do is say we have an internal standard which says we need each threat line to have a score of 1.5. That, that's our, our goal. So again, this falls below the standard and you need to improve this um, the quality of the, your controls or add another control. Um, now this of course uh, interesting. Uh, I've also done uh, a uh, map combining a LOPA with Bowtie, uh, which does yeah basically it is very similar. Only you have a frequency for each uh, threat and you have a probability of failure for each control, and then with those two you can actually calculate. Uh, the end frequency of your consequence, uh, and then you can uh, assess whether you're actually a LARP or not. Uh, so combine both, because both I and LOPA have a lot in common. Uh, so you can actually uh, combine those two methodologies into one thing with uh, using both Excel. Um, so one last example of both Excel is this. Um, this is another project which is actually a bit bigger than um, the previous one. Um, for this project we actually um, asked ourselves, okay, so we, we have this, we scored the effectiveness in a workshop. Um, so should we assume that the effectiveness that we, we assess in a workshop is actually the real effectiveness of the whole time. And of course not. Uh, but then how do you correct your effectiveness uh, based on, uh, so how do you correct your original assessment of the effectiveness of your controls? Uh, and in this case, we used uh, several data sources to um, correct the original effectiveness. So what you see in this case, in this bow tie, is the original effectiveness is underneath each control. So in the work, bow tie workshop, this control was 0 0.7. Uh, but based on some data, we've actually corrected the effectiveness to 0 0.4, making it a yellow control. Now, what are those data sources? One of them is, for instance, incidents. So you can actually you take your incidents and map them onto a bow tie. So you see here, this control has filled in 12 incidents. This one is filled in 20 incidents. Um, so that's one type of data that you can use 
to uh, say, okay, we originally we thought this was a with the control was 80% effective, but since it's been since it's failed in 12 instances, the reliability is really low. So we uh, we need to adjust the effectiveness to I don't know 0 0.6 or 0 0.5. Uh, of course, incidents is not the only one. You can also do audits. And you can say uh, this has been judged negatively in six audits. Uh, inspections, permit to work is an interesting one as well. You can actually take all of your isolated controls uh, and also map them onto the diagram. So you say, okay, this control has been is, is, has been isolated by the permit to work system. Um, so it's not there. And in the end, what you get is a, a aggregation of all of those. Uh, data sources, and you actually, you're combining things that haven't really been combined. So in the end, the end result in this case, you have one control which has a uh, effectiveness of zero in this case because it's been isolated by the permit to work system. This control has actually filled in a lot of incidents, uh, so the original effectiveness is actually being um, sort of reduced. And let's say this has also been judged negatively in audits for a lot, in a lot of audits, so it's also being uh, corrected um, in a negative way. And combining those those different data sources, you sort of get an emergent picture of, uh, of the real risk you're running from a day-to-day -day, on a day-to-day -day basis. What's the real uh, the updated real risk? Um, and of course, before these things weren't really combined, so you wouldn't combine the permit to work system with the findings from your incidents and the findings from your audits and map them all in one place so you can get an emergent view of uh, the real risk rating or the real risk picture. Um, so this is one of the things which we're doing with um, uh, advanced barrier management. That's what we're basically calling it. Um, now, taking it one step back, because this is the the end the end stop. This is the probably one of the most advanced things that you'll end up doing with both eyes. Taking one step back, uh, this is one of the examples that you can download from our site. It's a uh, loss of containment example, and really what it comes down to is start start uh, walking before you before you run. And uh, walking in this case is just building bow ties. Uh, so each organization should really start by just building good bow ties. That's where everything starts. And then uh, you can take it from there and, and really grow into a lot more advanced things. Um, but really just building a good loss of containment bow tie is a, um, yeah, a good starting point and you'll, you'll get results not, not at the end with, with your advanced barrier management, but right away when people see this bow tie and they, you, you've told them in two minutes how it works, uh, they'll get sort of hopefully at least uh, a better risk awareness. Um, so you can actually download this from the site, it's free. And um, yeah, you can use uh, BOTEXP to, um, to edit this to your particular, uh, uh, particular setup. Um, okay, so I've shown you a couple of a sort of a quick overview of what you can do with the software. Uh, it's of course not the only thing that you can do with the software. There's a lot more, uh, but uh, yeah, I suggest if you're really interested in what what all of the functionalities are and what you can, how far you can take it, uh, if you follow a course, there's um, there's plenty of time to go into uh, a lot of these things. Um, Okay, so I'd like to, uh, this is about it for me, so um, we can switch back to um, the U.S. office. Can, do I need to do that or do you do it? Uh, Alex? <laughs> Okay, guys, uh, give me 20, about 30 seconds to reconfigure here. Can somebody switch the mics over there? No, no, I mean the um, speakers, I guess. If you unplug this, oh, you, you just unplug it for now. That's good.
And of course, online. <laughs> Are we going back to our calendar? Yes, is that, is that easy to do? Okay. All right. Uh, again, I'm Steve Marr. Alex, Don, thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate the overview of the Bowtie XP software. And what I'd like to do is emphasize a couple of key points as we close out and then tell you what's coming up. So what I'd like to do, and this is something that Alex was alluding to, is the close coupling between bow tie assessments and other very common and uh, hazards analysis techniques. There's a lot of overlap. There's a lot of places where you want to use it and not. As, um, as, as the, the hazards analysis classical tools, such as HAZOP, what if, fault tree analysis, FMECA, and hazards, these are all part of the universe of quantitative risk assessment tools, trying to achieve a perspective of severity and likelihood so you can appreciate are there any weaknesses or vulnerabilities in the design to fix it. Bowtie goes a step further and deals not only with delving into the assessment portion in greater detail, but also providing tools for management, as Alex mentioned. Uh, the common tools are, we find the workhorses of assessing risks and helping management manage them are on the screen right now. The hazards analysis tools, uh, SIL allocation tar uh, targeting, and also SIL verification, layer protection analysis, or LOPA, and also bow ties. As Alex mentioned, bow ties, LOPA, there's a lot of correlation there, as well as the hazards analysis. What we find is very efficient just as Alex said, as bow ties, you don't do it for everything, but you use hazards analysis techniques at various details during various design phases to flush out all your scenarios, all your potential weaknesses, and identify the high consequence and potentially high risk scenarios. Those, you can use other analytical tools to further assess risk, perhaps using a LOPA, and bow tie can be applied to your highest uh, uh, risk or highest consequence scenarios. A small subset to give you a lot more detail and allow you to manage them, either by uh, understanding them better and by using the conditional effectiveness tool in the Bowtie XP software to look at, at are they are components out of service, are there difficulties with achieving the reliability you want with equipment, etc. So that's where the, the bridging, that's how you bridge the gap and use these tools. That's one mechanism for using these tools effectively. Um, and another uh, way of looking at is your, your quantitative risk assessment or if you're quantifying things, you can get details on high-end scenarios, uh, LOPA, fault tree analysis, event tree analysis, couple that with the phenomenology investigations that you might do as part of your consequence analysis to give you an idea of the quantitative risk associated with those top scenarios that were originally identified using a tool such as hazard and operability study, and then use bow tie to pull all those together in terms of a more detailed analytical model that the, you then use to help you manage the risks at the facility. Identify those top contributors to risk, the higher consequence scenarios, the high risk scenarios, and then develop mechanisms for managing them. Uh, so just in conclusion, good applications are offshore, and onshore high consequence facilities. Um, safety cases, in a lot of cases, you can get a lot from applying the, the bow tie analysis. And various guidance documents uh, that are out there actually incorporate the use of bow tie assessments in formulating the safety case. Uh, if you're a plant manager who wants to better understand and manage the hazards at your facility, you can use these analytical tools, including bow tie analysis to help you manage the, the things that can cause the greatest catastrophes or greatest potential risks at your facilities. And if you're um, a, a corporation with many different facilities or an agency that's got to manage many different facilities in your jurisdiction, you may want the highest risk scenarios from the high hazard facilities in your, in your area or in your corporation, identify those, and that helps focus your management efforts. So hopefully we've shown you as part of this webinar the basics of some of these hazards analysis techniques, the regulatory requirements, how they can work together and give you a lot more detail on bow tie analysis, which actually allows you to bridge the gap between actually assessing risk and managing it.
what I want to do is give you a little bit of more resources and references for you to take home. Um, what we do as part of our, as, as I mentioned, this is part of our SEMS webinar series for offshore facilities where we take our background and insights from applying uh, these as part of our engineering consulting activities in for helping people formulate SEMS, PSM, and RMP programs. And uh, taking that, and we've got a, these uh, webinar series recorded. They're available on our website. You've all got the uh, link to that that was sent out in the invitation. And this is an example of some of the items in the series. We've tried to cover some of the, the areas that, that tripped people up and are considered more important. Mechanical integrity programs, uh, hazards analysis basis, safety and environmental information, operating procedures, and we've got several coming up to cover all the other elements of SIMS. The next one coming up is next week, and that's practical approaches to implementing management change and also pre-startup reviews. Again, a key element of not only the current SEMS program, but previous SEMS programs and other safety management systems such as PSM, RMP, and safety cases. And this webinar will help you with the MOC and pre-startup review item. Uh, Ken Hofford and possibly Judith Sakairos will be the key presenters for that. Also, for, for bow ties, we've got a uh, two-day bow tie boot camp, a training session going on at our training facility in Irvine, California. That'll be on September 21st to 22nd. We'll be sending out an announcement for that, and that will involve uh, individuals from risk management professionals and CGE in an on-site on training course as I mentioned at our Irvine, California facility. Uh, also coming up, I mentioned the June 7th webinar. We've got other webinars coming up. Uh, there's a, a really, um, some nice applications coming out to help uh, people who are subject to SEMS requirements for offshore facilities manage the implementa implementation of job safety analysis and also operating procedures which can be interlinked. Uh, we've also coming up on, on audit requirements and gap assessments. Uh, the Offshore Operating Commi Committee is coming up with some really good uh, audit techniques. Uh, we want to bring those into play along with our, our own techniques internally and provide a really robust audit approach on July 21st as part of our webinar series. Uh, training coming up on August 9th, incident investigation the 13th of September. I mentioned our two-day Bowtie Boot Camp on September 21st through 22nd, and also October 10th, uh, emergency action plans. Uh, we've, we've chosen the dates because the key deadline for SEMS is coming up on November 15th this year, and we wanted to provide technical resources to uh, both our clients and all the folks who want to participate in our webinar series and make sure those are closed out and on the books before that November 15th deadline. Again, if you guys have any tough problems or, or need, some, need to ask people some questions about SEMS implementation, Call us even before then. I know a lot of you are dealing right now with trying to pull these SEMS programs together. Uh, I've listed out some other resources here, um, various websites, some of our own, DOEMRE and API. API has got another a good interface right now where a lot of its standards that were safety related are now available to you to look at online after you sign up. That includes uh, most of the 14 uh, API recommended practice 14 series and others associated with, with offshore platform safety. So um, what I'd like to do first of all is thank you for attending. Appreciate you guys joining us and I hope this is beneficial to you, not only in terms of how to pull all these different elements together, but a lot more detail on bow tie analysis and using it for risk management. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to invite questions both from the on-site participants here and also the folks who are tuning into our webinar, and you're welcome to ask questions of either me, Steve Marr, Matthias Bradel, Sanem Sermelli, John Bergwerf, or Alex DeRyder. Anything uh, coming up on the... Uh... No. Okay, uh, questions, you can ask them via the uh, texting the, the webcast producer, Solve Sather, or if you'd like to be unmuted and uh, interact with the group, you're welcome to do that too. All right, I guess we did a great job. And yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us. And we'll look forward to uh, your joining for upcoming uh, webinars. And also that uh, two-day boot camp in September should be very beneficial for those of you who are 
uh, in the business of applying bow ties to your facilities. Thank you. And transmission.